Teenagers everywhere seek their own space away from prying eyes. But it's rare that they get active encouragement from parents. Most people in the West would regard it as extremely strange to actually build a hut to enable our teenagers to go and have sex. And I think that we would regard that as a taboo. Love huts in Cambodia can be perceived as being taboo because we look at parents as protectors and safeguarders of a woman's virginity or sexuality, not promoters of it. During the day, Korean girls and boys keep their distance. But after dark, they get together. Their games seem innocent and childlike. But as the fire burns low, the atmosphere heats up. Nang Wan heads back to her hut, while Nang Chan waits for a visitor. When you have a boyfriend over to visit, you don't talk loudly or joke around too much, or your parents will know the boy is there. Korean girls try to be discreet, even though sex before marriage is not taboo. And according to the girls, it's their choice, not the boys. If I want to sleep with a boy, I'll ask about his background. If he's a lazy boy or a bad boy, then I won't invite him. If he is a good, handsome, industrious boy, then I might decide to sleep with him. Some observers believe the love huts give the girls control and independence. I think one of the advantages of the love huts custom is giving such great empowerment to young women and letting them explore their own sexuality, but also their own, I think, um, decision-making and judgment around who to mate with and who to have as a partner. While there's no hard data, it seems this empowerment of young girls may mean rape and domestic violence are relatively rare. I've never heard of this kind of action, forcing the girl to have sex. When a girl says no, the boy won't try and do it. Before the rest of this Kriung village awakes, boys leave the love huts and head home. Only when a couple are engaged will they be seen together in daylight. 